We, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we come to the chapter of Al Hajj and Umrah. Any ibadah which you need to perform, before performing that ibadah, you have to make sure you understand the rulings pertaining to those ibadat. Especially the arkan, the fundamental pillars or, or obligations of that ibadah. Because if you, form, if you perform that ibadah and you don't fulfill the fundamental pillars or obligations of that ibadah, then perhaps that ibadah is invalid. So the arkan of hajj, the fundamental pillars of hajj are four. First of all, you have to have the intention or the niyyah that you are intending to perform hajj or umrah. Secondly, to stay at Arafah. And then thirdly, tawaf al ifada, And this is a tawaf which is performed after Arafah. And then the sa'i of al-hajj. And these are the four arkan, fundamental pillars of hajj. And similar to this are the fundamental pillars of the umrah, but without Arafah. So the intention to perform the rituals of hajj, to stop at Arafah. And when does the stopping at Arafah begin? And so the, the obligation of stopping at Arafah, when does it begin? It begins on the Adhan of Dhuhr on the ninth day of Dhul Hijjah. And it extends to the Adhan of Al Maghrib. Adhan Al Fajr, Yom Al Eid. It extends to the Adhan of Fajr on the day of Al Eid. And then the third pillar of Hajj is the Tawaf, known as Tawaf Al Ifada. And this is performed after Arafah. And then finally, the Sa'i of Al Hajj. And the pillars of Umrah are similar to the pillars of Hajj, except without the stopping at Arafah, meaning the intention and the Tawaf and the Sa'i. And the Talbiya, i.e. the statement, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, this is different from the intention or the Niyya of Al Hajj. And the niyyah, it is said in the heart. Upon whom is hajj an obligation? It is an obligation upon every Muslim who is over the age of puberty. However, if a child under the age of puberty performs hajj, he attains some reward. And also those who are responsible for him making hajj, meaning his guardians, also attain reward. But this does not suffice him for making the obligatory hajj of Islam. And then the next condition is that the person has to be sane. And therefore, the one who is mentally insane or has mental disabilities does not need to perform hajj. It is not an obligation upon him. And the one who has the ability to perform hajj. And how do we recognize whether somebody has the ability or not? So this one asks, am I able or not? So this depends, the ability to perform hajj or not, this depends from person to person, place to place. For example, this one, in Britain, there are certain rules and regulations in terms of the legal requirements of performing Hajj. And also one of the conditions which were prevalent or which were important previously was that a person has to be, a f has to be free and not a slave. Of course, this doesn't apply to us today. And then for the women, there's one additional condition and that is the presence of a mahram if she's required to travel. What are the obligations of Hajj? Who knows? Has nobody performed hajj and nobody intends to perform hajj? Firstly, assuming the ihram from the miqat. And the mawaqit or the miqat, there are two types. Some of them relate to a place, i.e. landmarks, and others, others relate to a particular time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wanted to ennoble and exalt this house, Bayt Allah al Haram. And for this reason, in order to honor and exalt Bayt al Haram, Allah subhana made it a condition that whoever intends to visit and make Umrah or Hajj, before he even enters into that area, he has to have assumed the state of Ihram, meaning he's wearing those clothes which consist of uh, the, the Izar uh, and the, 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 top, the two garments. Uh, so for example, from Britain, uh, whenever the plane comes from Britain, the majority of the cases, it passes over Jeddah. And so before a person reaches the landmark, he should have assumed the ihram. So for example, the people who are traveling in for Hajj from Britain, many of them, they will 
begin to wear the clothing of ihram, meaning the top and the izar, before they even get on the plane. At Heathrow, for example, they start changing their clothes. And this is permissible. However, you do not enter into the state of ihram by way of intention until you are, or just before you are about to pass over the miqat. And this is why you find that the captain of the plane, about five or ten minutes before you pass over the miqat, he will make an announcement that we are parallel to the miqat, and so assume your ihram, i.e. by way of intention, and then enter into the state of ihram. And sometimes there are some groups or travel organizations, and insta instead of stopping at Jeddah, their first stop is al Madina, meaning straight from Britain to al Madina to Nabawiyyah. And therefore in that situation, a person enters into the state of Ihram from the Miqat of al Madina. So these are Mawaqeet which relate to landmarks. Whoever passes by these landmarks has to pass by them in a state of Ihram. And then there are other mawaqith which relate to time. As for Umrah, in terms of the time, any time throughout the year a person is able to perform Umrah. However, some people, they uh, give certain virtues to certain times. And this was not narrated from the Prophet wasallam. And if there was any goodness in this, then the Prophet wasallam would have preceded us in it. So as for the miqat of hajj in terms of the time zone, when do the days of hajj begin? So it's permitted for a person or the time for the actions of hajj, it begins on the first of shawwal. It begins on the first of shawwal and extends to dhul hijjah. If a person, he began the actions of hajj on the night of Eid al-Fitr, Mean the first of Shawwal. No. So he did the actions of Umrah and then he came out of his Ihram. No. And then he entered into the Ihram once more later during the days of Hajj and completed his Hajj. Then he is he's performing Hajj at Tamattu'. Tamattu, no. After this, the obligations of Hajj, we said, assuming the state of Ihram from the Miqat, that it's not permitted for a person to pass by the landmarks, the Miqat, except that he's in this, a, a state of ihram if he's intending hajj or umrah. Secondly, uh, uh, and the second obligation is that a person uh, does not la yakhruj. La yumkin al khuruj min arafa qabla ghurub al shams. Hada min al wajibat. From the obligation is. Lakin la wa kharaj tarak wajib. Lakin adrak al rukun. Naam. If the, the second obligation is that a person is not permitted to leave arafa until the sun has set. So the first one that we mentioned in terms of stopping at Arafah, this was from the Arkan. The wajib is that he does not leave uh, Arafah until the sun has set. So if he stopped at Arafah and then he left, he has fulfilled the pillar. However, he did not fulfill this obligation. And from the obligations is to remain a part of the night in Muzdalifa. And also, the stoning of the pillars. On the day of Eid, it's only one single pillar which is stoned. And as for the 11th, 12th, and 13th of Hajj, the one who is staying until the 13th of Dhul Hijjah, then he stones all three pillars. And also remaining some of the night at Mina. And this is during the nights of At Tashriq. And At Tashriq is the 11th, 12th, and 13th of Dhul Hijjah. Naam. And also uh, shaving the hair or shortening it. As for tawaf al wida, which is the farewell tawaf, i.e. the last action which you do, then this is from the obligations, but it is not from the obligations of hajj. So we said, not passing the miqat without assuming the state of ihram, and then remaining in Arafah until the sun has set, and then staying a portion of the night in Muzdalifah before Eid, in the night of Eid, i.e. before the day of Eid and remaining a portion of the night in Mina on the days of at tashriq the 11th, 12th, and 13th of Dhul-Hijjah, and then stoning the, the pillar and uh, shaving or cutting the hair. So if we wanted to perform Hajj 
and this is Mecca, and then Mina, then Arafah. لا مزدلفة. مزدلفة then Arafah. نعم. So the boundaries of the Haram, Mina and Muzdalifa are within the boundaries of the Haram. As for Arafah, it is external to the boundaries of the Haram, i.e. the boundaries of Mecca. And the meaning of Muzdalif and Mina being within the boundaries of the Haram and Araf being external to the boundaries of the Haram, that there are certain actions which are permitted outside the boundaries of Haram, like in Arafah, and not permitted within the boundaries of the Haram. For example, hunting. So hunting is not permitted within the boundaries of the Haram. And this includes Mina and Muzdalifa. But in Arafah, because you are in Hill, I outside of the Haram, it is permitted. And this is why Arafah is known as Mashar al-Halal. I places in which people can perform some of the virtuous actions like the Masajid. As for Muzdalifa, then it is Mashar al-Haram, i.e. within the boundaries of the Haram. On the eighth day of the Hijjah, on the eighth day of the Hijjah, the one who is intending to perform Hajjah Tamattu' he assumes the ihram. So on the 8th of the Hijjah, the one who is intending to perform the Hajj of a tamattu', he places on and he assumes the state of ihram and then he comes to uh, Mina, typically at Duha time, meaning before Zawal, i.e. before noon. And when he comes to Mina, then he prays Salat al-Dhuhr, two raka'at, at the time of Dhuhr. And he prays Salat al-Asr at the time of Asr, again two raka'at. And he prays Salat al-Maghrib in the time of Maghrib, three raka'at. And he prays Isha in the time of Salat al-Isha, two raka'at. And then he remains Bimina. that and then he remains that night in Mina. And then he prays Salat al-Fajr in Mina. And then after Salat al-Fajr, I on that morning, he then goes to Arafah. And then whilst he is in Arafah, he combines between Dhuhr and Asr at the earlier time, i.e. he brings the Asr forward to the time of Dhuhr. And then after praying Salat al-Dhuhr and Salat al-Asr, then he remains in Arafah, in the plains of Arafah until Maghrib time, until sunset. And he turns towards the Kaaba and he supplicates to Allah in that place. And he can stay at any, he can stand at any place or any part in the grounds of or the plains of Araf. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never climbed the mount which is known today as the mountain of Ar-Rahmah, he never climbed it. And once the sun has set, then he returns back and goes towards Muzdalifa. And in Muzdalifa, he combines between Salat al-Maghrib and Isha, however at the latter time, meaning he delays Maghrib to the Isha time and then he sleeps in Muzdalif and then he wakes up and he prays Fajr at its earlier time and then the Hajj he turns towards the Qibla and he spends a long time in supplicating to Allah and then from Muzdalifa he goes to Mina and then he goes to the largest uh, pillar and that is the last pillar, meaning the one that is closest, closest to Mecca and furthest away from Muzdalifa. So, if these are the three pillars that are to be stoned, the pillar which is closest to Mecca, this is known as Jamratul Aqaba. And this is stoned on the day of Eid with seven small pebbles. So, on the day of Eid, he stones the Jamratul Aqaba with seven small pebbles or stones and then the animal is slaughtered and then he shaves his hair and shaving the hair is better than shortening the hair however both are permitted and then after this he enters into Mecca and then he performs tawaf around the Kaaba seven times and this is the tawaf which is the rukan the fundamental pillar of Hajj no. And then he makes a sa'i, meaning between Safa and Marwa, if he is mutamatte or he has not performed sa'i already. And then after this, he returns back to Mina. And then he remains the night and sleeps the night at Mina. And then the remaining days of Hajj, ay Ayyam al the 11th and the 12th and the 13th, he stones each one of the three pillars. And this is after the Adhan of Dhuhr, the smaller pillar and the middle pillar and then Jamratul Aqaba. Naam. And ba each one seven small stones. So once he has stoned the first pillar, he goes towards the right of the pillar and he faces the Kaaba, 
the qibla and he makes dua. And then he comes to the second or the middle pillar and he goes towards the left and he faces the qibla and he makes dua. Then he stones the third pillar and then there's no dua after the third pillar. Then he returns. How does a, a person perform umrah? So when it comes to umrah, firstly, a person assumes the state of ihram at the miqat. And he places on the two garments, the upper garment and the lower garment of ihram. And as soon as he intends to enter the state of ihram, then he has forbidden certain matters upon himself. Firstly, being in the state of ihram means that it's not permitted for him to shave or cut his hair and also to cut his nails or trim his nails and to perfume himself and for no. the male that he's not able to cover his head meaning something which touches his head like a hat or a scarf and neither does he wear any type of knitted garment like the thobe or trousers only the garments of ihram and of course this pertains to the male and not the female and also he's not permitted to hunt any land animals and neither is the person permitted to uh, conduct or uh, be a part of a nikah whether it's the wali the guardian or the bride or the groom and also it is forbidden for him to uh, have intimate relations or anything which is before that and then after this the person who is making umrah he begins to say the talbiyah and the talbiyah, meaning labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, this talbiyah, this is a person answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu he ordered Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam to tell the people to come and perform hajj and umrah. So when a person says the talbiyah, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, he's saying, oh Allah, I have answered your request. Oh Allah, I have answered your command. And a person makes the talbiyah, with La ilaha illallah affirming his tawheed. And this talbiya, it is an act of ibadah. And it is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the talbiya is not a song which is sung. And Shaykh Ibn Uthmi rahimullah, he mentioned this. He said talbiya is a type of dhikr. And it's not something which needs to be sung. And the person who is performing umrah, he, remain, he remains constant upon saying the talbiyah until he enters into Makkah. And then once a person enters into Makkah and sees the Kaaba, he stops the talbiyah. Naam. And then he stands parallel to the black stone. And then when he stands parallel to the black stone, he exposes his right shoulder by placing the garment of ihram under his armpit and over the left shoulder. And then he makes the takbir by saying Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. And, 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 and the Kaaba is towards his left. So from the black stone, and as he walks around with the Kaaba on his left hand side to the black stone again, now this is one circumambulation, this is one tawa. And in some of these guides, in some of the books, you will find that for the first circumambulation, the first tawaf, there is a particular type of dhikr. And then in the second tawaf, there's another type of dhikr. And this is incorrect. There's no specific dhikr for each tawaf. Rather, a person remembers Allah and makes any type of dhikr and makes dua, recites the Quran. And then when a person is making the tawaf around the Kaaba, when he reaches the corner, which is before the corner where the Hajr Aswad is. And this corner is known as a rukan al-Yamani. So when a person reaches this corner, he does not make takbir, he does not say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, but then he begins to make the dua, Rabbana atina vid dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa qina adhab al nar. And then he does not increase anything in addition to this. And then when he reaches the Hajr Aswad, now he has performed the first tawaf. And he carries on doing so until he has performed seven tawaf around the Kaaba. The last time when he finishes at Al-Hajr Al-Aswad, there is no more takbir, there is no more dua. And now he covers his shoulder and he prays a nafal, two raka'at, and this is known as the sunnah of tawaf. And these two raka'at that he has, to, he has to pray in this position, he shouldn't be an obstacle for those people performing tawaf. Meaning it can be prayed anywhere behind maqam Ibrahim, even if you are further away and you should not be an obstacle for the people and then he prays these two raka'at in the first raka'ah he recites surah al-fatiha 
and then surat qul ya ayyul kafirun and then in the second raka'a he recites surat al fatiha and then surat qul huwa allahu ahad and then after this he walks to as safa the mount safa and these are two mountains as safa and al marwa when the person reaches the mount safa it is recommended for the person to recite the ayah in as safa wal marwa min sha'airillah that as safa and marwa are from the great symbols of allah al hajj and of course if you go to the mount safa a person is able to walk all around the mountain and this is not required rather he has to come to the foot of the mountain i where the edge of the passageway is so a person comes to the foot of the mountain or the edge of the passageway and he faces the qibla and he says allahu akbar allahu akbar allahu akbar la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu almulk wa lahu alhamd wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lah anjaza wa'da wa nasara 'abda wa hazama al ahzab wahda and then he makes this dhikr and after completing this dhikr then he raises his hands and he makes dua and then after this he lowers his hands and he says this dhikr again and after completing this this dhikr he raises his hands once more and he supplicates to allah and then he makes the dhikr once more and then after making this dhikr then he walks from safa to the foot of the mount marwa and then whilst he's walking and making sa'i between as safa and al marwa he makes any dhikr any remembrance of allah so there is no specific dua or dhikr for walking between as safa and marwa except for that dhikr which was mentioned at safa and at marwa and whilst a person is walking and making sa'i between safa and marwa he continues walking until he sees the marks mazat khadra alamat khadra naam and there are green lights which are still there today so as soon as as soon as he sees those green lights then he can quicken his walking and one passage from safa to marwa this is one sa'i and then back from marwa to safa this is the second one meaning the seventh one where will it end will it end at safa or marwa it will end at marwa the seventh one will be at marwa so yeah. when a person makes the sa'i seven times then the seventh seventh one it will end at marwa however on the seventh time when he ends at marwa he does not stand to face the qibla and make dua rather he immediately goes to get his hair shaved or cut and then his hair is shaved with a razor and this is better and more virtuous more rewarding or his hair is cut or shortened however this is lesser than it being shaved and as for uh, the females then they tie their hair together and a small amount like a small part of the finger this is cut from the hair and when it comes to the actions of the men and the women during hajj and umrah then they are the same except that the woman who is in a state of ihram she does not uh, tie the face veil down covering her face and neither does she wear gloves covering her hands meaning does she uncover and expose her face meaning what's not permitted for her is to tie the niqab down over her face but she can take a piece of cloth and place it in front of her face without tying it down to the face and there's no specific clothing for women who are in the state of ihram meaning the sisters they are permitted to wear any type of clothing and there's nothing which is specified for the ihram except that the general rulings apply so there should not be clothing which beautify her no attract people's attention or looks no clothing of zina or clothing of fitna and neither should they be perfumed so there are three types of hajj there is a hajj which is known as at-tamattu and second which is qiran and third which is ifrad these are three different types of hajj as for hajj at-tamattu what is it the hajj at-tamattu is for a person to perform a complete umrah in the time zone of hajj which we mentioned from the beginning of shawal before the days of hajj and this is before the stopping at arafa which is the 9th of dhul hijjah tamam from yani from the beginning of shawal naam all the way to the 9th of dhul hijjah a person performs a complete umrah and then the one who is performing hajj at tamattu he shortens the hair and he does not shave 
And after having performed the Umrah, this person who is performing Hajj to Matu, then he exits from the state of Ihram. When does he resume his Ihram and place on the clothing of Ihram once more? As we said, on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, uh, before Zawal, he has to as make the Talbiyah or the intention and then assume the state of Ihram once more. And then he performs Umrah uh, Hajj as we mentioned, meaning he goes to Arafah, he has to stay the night at the Muzdalifah, and then he has to stay the night in Mina during the days of Tashriq, the 11th, and he has to perform the Tawaf, which is known as Tawaf al ifada and this is a Tawaf which is done after stopping at Arafah. And then he has to make the Sa'i of Al-Hajj, meaning he has made two sets of Tawaf, because the first one was made in his Umrah, and the second one is the Tawaf al ifada and he has performed two sets of sa'i, either sa'i in his first umrah, and now the sa'i as part of his hajj. And then the one who is doing hajj tamattu' upon him is to slaughter the animal. And hajj tamattu', yani this form or this type of hajj, it is the best form and the most virtuous, the most rewarding, and Allah knows best. And then the second type of hajj is known as qiran, meaning the person he combines between hajj and umrah meaning he does not come out of his ihram, he stays within the ihram. The two types of hajj, either qarin and ifrad, their actions are exactly the same, different to the mutamatti'. The only difference is that the one who is doing the hajj al-qiran, then he has to slaughter the animal. And the one who is doing the hajj al-ifrad, he does not slaughter the animal. So what is the description of the Hajj of Qiran and Ifrad. That he makes the Ihram for Hajj, he enters into the state of Ihram from the Miqat. So the Mufrid and the Qarin, they enter into Mecca after assuming the state of Ihram and they make Tawaf and a Sa'i. Or the person can delay his Sa'i until after standing at Arafah. Meaning, he can either go to Mina on the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah or he can go to Arafah on the ninth day of the Hijjah. So he stands at Arafah, and then Araf, from Arafah he returns to Muzdalifah, and then from Muzdalifah he goes on to Mina, and then he stays the nights of the days of Tashriq, and then he has to make Tawaf, either Tawaf al-Ifadah, after stopping at Arafah, and then he makes the Sa'i of Al-Hajj. Wallahu a'lam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 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 wa